Hey, and welcome again to HDBB. My name's Dan, I'm one of the pastors here, and today we're gonna to be finishing our series in the wilderness. Over the last four weeks, we've been looking at this key time in the life of the people of God, that after he brought them out of slavery, but before he took them into the promised land, they had to go through the wilderness. And in many ways, it's quite a good picture of the season that we've been through over the last few months, that we had our old way of doing our lives and we're going towards this next normal. And in between, there's been a lot of challenges and uncertainty, a lot of busyness and boredom. But the key thing we've seen in this series as we look at this time is that God uses this time to teach his people and to form them. In fact, many of the most defining things about the people of God, the law they live by, the way they worship, the shape of their schedules is given to them in this time in the wilderness. And then they choose to take it with them into the promised land. Now, one of the key things is they didn't have to. It was totally up to them. One of the things we see in these stories is that whilst God is faithful, he will not force us to follow him. So I suppose the question for us is, what has the Lord been teaching you? And what do you want to carry with you into this next normal? One of the ways that we've been keeping sane as a family is by playing a lot of board games. And I mean a lot. We've played every variation of Catan, Ticket to Ride, Seven Wonders. But th there is one game that we haven't been playing, and that is chess. And the reason we haven't been playing chess is because there's only one good chess player in our family. That's my father-in-law, Steve, and the rest of us are rubbish. Now, there's a bit of an analogy here for us. You, you can tell a bad chess player, it's been said, by the fact that they use their queen too much. Like a bad chess player uses their queen all the time. They're, they're moving their queen all over the board, trying to control every element of the game. Whereas a good chess player, it's said, barely uses their queen uh, until the end of the game. And then suddenly they tend to win with their rook and their queen, having aligned everything else with their other pieces. Now, what that means is if you wanna teach somebody to get better at chess, one of the ways you can do that is by taking away the queen. You take the queen off the board and then you make them play with all of their other pieces. And once they've learned to win, without their queen, just with the other pieces, you, you then give them their queen back and you say, look how easy it is to win now. And I wonder if there's a picture for us in this season, in this way, that over these past few months, the Lord has allowed some of the things that we relied on, good things like the queen is a strong piece, but he's allowed some of those things to be taken away from us for a time so that we might learn to play with everything that he's made available to us. And in doing so, he's preparing us to play better in this next normal, to follow him more closely, to lead more effectively, to give more sacrificially, and to love more extravagantly. See, I don't know about you, but I don't want to have lived through one of the biggest upheavals in our world, uh, in our lifetime, and not have allowed the spirit of the living God to use it to make me more like Christ. And the good news is, neither does he. And that's what we're going to see in our reading today. So our final story in this series is found at the end of the book of Numbers. Now, the book of Numbers often gets overlooked, partly because it's got kind of a dry title, Numbers. Like, it's not that interesting unless you're like an engineer or in finance or uh, an accountant. Actually, that's probably most of HDBB. Um, anyway, in the Hebrew tradition, it's called In the Wilderness, which is so much cooler, very Bear Grylls-esque. And, uh, and this story uh, it comes at the end of the 40 years in the wilderness. And it's quite long, it's three chapters, starting at Numbers 22, but don't worry, I'm not gonna read it all. I'm just gonna take us through and stop at the key moments. So all along through this journey in the wilderness, the people have been grumbling and complaining. Are we nearly there yet? And then they get towards the end, and this is what we read. Then the Israelites traveled to the plains of Moab 
and camped along the Jordan across from Jericho. This is the closest the people have ever been to the promised land. In fact, they can see it. It's just over the river. The end is in sight. The MCO is nearly lifted. And so they make camp one last time. Now, the king of Moab, this guy called King Balak, starts to freak out. And it's kind of reasonable. All of these people have just turned up in his country and they've made camp. And also he's heard about how powerful their God is. So he comes up with this cunning plan. He decides to hire a pagan sorcerer to help him out. So Balak, son of Zippor, who was the king of Moab at that time, sent messengers to summon Balaam, son of Beor. Balak said, a people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the land and have settled next to me. Now, come and put a curse on these people because they're too powerful for me. Perhaps then I'll be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. And so these messengers, they go off and they take a load of cash to pay him. And Balaam says, well, I better check with the Lord. So he prays. And God said to Balaam, do not go with them. Very clear. Do not go with them. You must not put a curse on these people because they are blessed. So he goes back to the men and he says, cannot. And then they go, well, how about some more money? And he goes, can. And he goes with them because he thinks that's a good idea. Even his donkey doesn't think this is a good idea. And on the way, he encounters the Lord. And when he sees the Lord, he says, I have sinned. I did not realize you were standing in the road to oppose me. Now, if you are displeased, I'll go back. The angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with the men, but speak only what I tell you. So he goes, but despite this clear warning, three times he just says his own thing and he tries to curse them. He stands up in the mountains above the people of God, but every time he tries to curse them, he finds he can only bless them. And at the last attempt to curse them, God gives Balaam a vision of a future king that will come from these people and bring God's leadership and justice to the entire world. And so both King Balak and Balaam give up and go home. But here's the thing. Whilst all of this has been going on, the people of God have been oblivious to all of it. To all of it, they're just sitting in the wilderness in the valley below, grumbling and complaining, totally unaware that up in the hills, God is fighting from them. And not only that, the very next thing we read is that while Israel was staying in Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with the Moabite women who invited them to sacrifice to the gods. So up above, God is being faithful, while down below, the people are being faithless. God is holding back their enemies while they're throwing themselves into the enemy's women's arms. God is striking down while they're swiping right, and they're too focused on their own complaints and grumbling to notice what God is doing. And I think what this story gives us, the promise it gives us, is that we can know that in every wilderness, even if we are faithless, God is faithful. That even if we don't see what he's doing, God is at work. And as it says in Romans, that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And so what has God been teaching you? And what are you gonna take with you into this next season? Because I've seen that the Lord has been shaping us as a church. And there are three things I've seen that we see in this story. Like we we don't expect the wilderness to be a great teacher. And in the same way, there are three very strange teachers in this story. Our first strange teacher is King Balak. And what he teaches us is that the battle is physical and is spiritual. King Balak sees his enemy and he freaks out. And so he calls on Balaam, who's this like witch doctor, Bomo type guy. And he says, now come and put a curse on these people because they are too powerful for me. Perhaps then I will be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. Balak knows that if he can cut them off spiritually, then he's more likely to be able to defeat them physically. That the battle is physical as well as spiritual. In fact, the Bible often speaks of three things that come against the goodness of God, the world, the flesh, 
and the devil. And we've seen that in this time, in this pandemic. Uh, The world, the world is broken. That's why we've got this virus causing this sickness. But there's also the flesh, that humans are often selfish and there's been cover-ups and there's been people not doing what they needed to do. But the Bible also speaks of the spiritual reality, that there is a devil, that there is evil. And it's not just a vague evil, it's personal. There's a spiritual enemy who works against us. And what's interesting is that even if we don't know it, our enemy does. Balak sees that this is going to be a physical battle, but he knows it's going to be a spiritual one too. Now, one of the things that's been really encouraging for me at this time is is that it seems that as a church, we've understood this, that we've got a grasp on this. Do you know what? There has never been so much prayer going on as in this season. Like we've always said that the foundation of everything we do at HDBB is prayer and worship. But in this season, that has gone up a gear. Like two examples, like at the beginning of this month, we had a season, a week of 24-7 prayer, where we didn't gather as a church, but as a dispersed church, we prayed for a whole week, everyone taking like an hour at a time, a bit like a prayer relay race, if you like. And usually when we do this, we fill up all the slots. Uh, But usually there's this guy, Richard, who has to save the day. And he takes some of the more anti-socially timed slots, 4 a.m., etc. This time, Richard didn't even get a look in. All the slots were gone before we'd even started. Another example, every day people have been meeting online for a prayer meeting every weekday at 6.30 since the MCO began. That's over 100 prayer meetings. And it started off with everyone praying in their homes. But as the restrictions have lifted, lifted, people have carried on meeting from the office or from their cars. There's one guy who even joined from the toilet. I won't name names. He thought we couldn't tell, but the echo gave him away. God has been calling his church to prayer. And it's not just us. Churches around the world have reported that the depth and passion of their prayer life has gone through the roof this season. And it's not just the church. Google back in March reported that searches for prayer and how to pray had skyrocketed. As the world has been humbled, the world has been driven to its knees in prayer. And so the question is, how are we going to continue this attitude of prayer? How are we going to take this rhythm of prayer into this next season? As the world speeds up again, as our calendars get fuller again, how do we keep prayer in its rightful place. And not just prayer, but persevering in prayer. It strikes me that Balak tries three times in three places at great cost to fight this spiritual battle. And he's only doing it because he thinks perhaps then I'll be able to defeat them. Whereas Jesus has told us that our prayers will make a difference. And when we pray, your kingdom come, he responds with a great, a thundering, a resounding amen. Balak teaches us the importance of prayer, that this is a physical battle, but it's a spiritual one too. The second strange teacher is Balaam. See, the people are in the valley and they're focused on themselves and their problems. And they're saying, my life is bad. Meanwhile, up in the hills, their enemy looks at them and says, they are blessed. Balaam says this, a people that has come out of Egypt covers the face of the land. And that's pretty amazing just there. They were slaves, now they're not. They were trapped, now they're free. They had their children taken away from them, now their families have multiplied. But it's almost too obvious to see. I've noticed that in my own life. I often need a friend, an outside voice to point out what's, if I'm honest, plainly obvious of what God is up to. Sometimes you can't see the wood for the trees. But then in light of this, Balaam seeks God for more information. And it's a great model. He takes himself away. He spends time asking the Lord. And this is what the Lord says. Don't go with them, these messengers who want want you to go and curse them. Don't go with them. You must not put a curse on these people because they are blessed. And then through the rest of the story, the Lord keeps revealing things about Israel to Balaam. Israel, they think God has left them. He says the Lord their God is with them. They think they have no leader. He says the shout of the king is amongst them. They think they are weak. He says they have the strength of a wild ox. And whilst they're complaining about their current situation, he speaks to them of the future. 
This is what he says, like valleys, they spread out, like gardens beside a river, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. Water will flow from their buckets. Their seed will have abundant water. They haven't taken the time to see what God is doing and they haven't thought about where it is they are going. They didn't count their blessings, but their enemy had. And if our enemy has counted our blessings, then maybe we should too. Now, as we count our blessings, it's not that the human heart is like a bucket and we're just sort of putting in the good stuff so we can leave all the bad stuff out. It's not like fill your heart with good thoughts so that the bad thoughts have no room because like, that doesn't really take into account the reality of some of the challenges we face. A more biblical image is, is not that the heart is like a bucket, but it's more like a pair of scales. And as you talk to God about the challenges you face, as you're honest about the struggles you face, it's like you put them on one side of the scales. But then as you count your blessings and put them on the other side of the scales, you will always see that the blessings outweigh the challenges. It's not that we, we don't have to ignore the challenges. This doesn't negate them. You can be totally honest to God about how you're feeling. To say, I'm struggling. I don't know why. I, I don't feel great. It's really important in this season that there is nothing that passes through the human heart that's unworthy of bringing before your father in prayer. But count your blessings too. Count your blessings. And do you know what? This can take time, especially because in this season, a lot of our metrics have become meaningless. A lot of the things we used to kind of guide us to know where we were have been thrown to the wind. But that just means it's even more important that like Balaam, you take some time, seek the Lord. And you know what? He will speak to you. He will tell you what he's been doing in your life and what he wants you to carry through into this next season. Balaam teaches us to look for what God is doing. Now, our third and last teacher is probably the strangest of all. The last teacher is the donkey. The donkey of all people teaches us to be aware of God's presence. So Balaam decides to disobey the Lord and try and do what the Lord has said, do not do, because the money is good. Terrible idea. So he saddles up his donkey, but as he tries to go, the donkey resists him. First, the donkey tries to turn around, then the donkey leans into a wall, and then the donkey just stops and sits down. Each time, Balaam responds by trying to beat the donkey to get him to do what he wants him to do. This is what we then read. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth and it said to Balaam, what have I done to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, you have made a fool of me. If only I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. The donkey said to Balaam, am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden to this day? Have I ever been in the habit of doing this to you? No, he said. In other words, there's something strange going on here, strange even before your donkey starts giving you feedbacks. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. So he bowed down low and fell face down. The comedy of this story is that it's all about seeing and not seeing. Israel should have seen that they are blessed. Balak should have seen that he's picking the wrong fight. And Balaam, the professional seer, it's his job to see. He has one job, see God, and he cannot see that the Lord is standing there right in front of him. And Balaam misses it because he's set his heart on the wrong thing. God has said, don't go, but because of the money, he goes. And setting his heart on the wrong thing means he misses the right thing. He can't see the presence of the Lord, even though his donkey can. Spending time in God's presence is the most important activity of your life. You need God's presence in your life more than you need anything else. In God's presence, we find everything that we need. I think of Andrew, who's uh, one of the team helping to run the food bank here. Andrew was not from a Christian family, although towards the end of his life, his grandfather put his trust in Jesus and was baptized. And when he heard about that, Andrew thought, well, I better find out a bit more. And so he, he started trying out going to church. And then he said, one day, 
when he wasn't going to go, the Holy Spirit prompted him. He said he, it felt like an urgency compelling him to go. And he came here to HDBB. And during the worship, he said it was that he felt like he was being hugged and that the love of God was being poured out into his heart. And he said in that moment, he gave his life to Christ. That is what God wants to do in our hearts every single day. He wants to pour out his love by his Holy Spirit so that we would know who we are and so that we would know in this strange and confusing world where he is taking us. And I know many of you have been doing that, seeking his presence for direction, pivoting your businesses, innovating in your workplaces, raising your kids, uh, speaking up for the voiceless. And I know that that has been costly and hard, but you've done it because that's where the presence of Jesus has been leading you. And I think there's an encouragement for us in this story. Uh, and it's the encouragement that Balaam is riding his donkey and he's trying to beat it to get it to go down the wrong path. And what's interesting is the donkey doesn't just stop. First of all, the donkey tries to find another way. And I think that's a picture for us. Often the world around us is trying to go the wrong way and beat us into coming with them. And our job in that moment is to look for God's guiding presence, to look for another way, to say there has to be a more creative option, a better way. And we might feel like a bit of a donkey in that moment. But as we see, it's the donkey who comes out on top. The one who follows God's presence will always end up where he wants us. And it doesn't matter if you've got it wrong before or if you've never received the Holy Spirit. What we read about Balaam is time and time again, he tries to do it his own way, but eventually he gives up and we read the Spirit of God came on him and he spoke this message. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. A ruler will come out of Jacob. And the wonderful thing is, the whereas Balaam saw him, but not now, beheld him, but not near, the one he saw came. Jesus Christ entered the world and he went through the worst wilderness there ever was. He went through the separation of the cross. And because he went through it and he lived and he not only lived, but he came back in resurrection life, we can know that as we follow him, through any wilderness, it will not lead to death, but will lead to everlasting life. And we can know that in every wilderness, we will not perish, but he is preparing us to take hold of every promise that he has for us. Amen. Why don't we stand and pray? Jesus, I thank you that you don't waste any season that we go through. And more importantly, that you are with us in every season. Jesus, I thank you that you've been at work in my life, where I've seen it and where I've not yet seen it. And I ask that you open my eyes, that I might see what you're doing and what you want to carry through into this next season. Holy Spirit, guide me now, I pray. Amen.